Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. I'm your host, Too Black. Um, this is a part two, somewhat, but it's a different title today. Um, before I get into that, I do want to apologize just because, as I'll explain a little more later, you know, I've been just very, very busy. So for some of our patrons, I apologize. We have been uploading extended content here lately. Um, in some cases, no content. So I want to apologize and definitely say we're going to get get back on schedule for that. But it's just been a busy few months. Um, that being said, the film that I was a co-director and producer for um, with the Defense Committee and with um, King Trill, um, the Pendleton 2, they stood up. Uh, for those who've been longtime listeners of this program, or at least for the last year, you're probably aware of the Pendleton 2. For those who don't know, um, the Pendleton 2 are two Indiana political prisoners, um, Christopher Naeem Trotter and uh, John Balagoon Cole, who were imprisoned for over 200 years for intervening to save a man's life um, inside inside Pendleton Prison, um, who was being attacked by what we know now was a a guard gang that was uh, ran by a KKK splinter group called the Sons of Light. Um, they received, again, 142 um, Naeem received 142 and Balagoon received 84 years. And then they spent 20 years and um, 32 years in solitary confinement. So we just produced a film um, and I'm going to really want to push people to watch that. I would even say watch that before you listen to what's on this episode. because This episode is deeply tied to that. But please watch that film. Um, it's going to be in the show notes. Um, you can look it up. It's the Pendleton 2. They stood up. It's on Breakthrough News on, on uh, YouTube. And if you are interested in holding a screening, um, in your local community, if you have a church, some kind of organization, some kind of connection, no matter where you're at, even if you're not in this country, um, you know, we can set that up and we can facilitate that through Zoom. If we can't physically be there, if we're in the area, we maybe we can show up um, and definitely please donate because um, this was a, you know, this was not this is not easy work. Um, but that that's the film we want to really highlight. So today you're going to hear the um you're going to hear the extended interviews that we could not get into the film um, of, of Balagoon and um, Naeem. Particularly, you're going to be hearing about their time in solitary confinement. So this is after the case. This is after the uprising in 85. This is after they've been, you know, sentenced to these, you know, to a de facto death penalty, not death, well, really, but the sentence to a, a life sentence. Um, you're going to hear those interviews today um because we only got to get a portion of those in the documentary but again i really encourage people i really want to push this rarely do i do that but i really want to push people to watch the film um go to youtube if you haven't already seen i know some of you were there for the premiere and i definitely want to shout out everybody who was particularly our our bpm crowd you really came through on a day on the same day that trump was indicted um uh, you really came through it helped populate the chat and and give us some views when a lot of people i think were interested in more more headline based news. Um so definitely want to appreciate that. But again, just to reiterate, um that's the film I've been working on. So that's why things have not been maybe as quick. We haven't had things posted as much these last few months because I've been trying to wrap that up. So again, I apologize. Um but that's the work I've been doing. So that's out now. So go see that. Um so the myth that ties into this again the the part two, because the part one was um tough on crime. And we basically our argument there was if your if the point is to reduce crime, then prisons and police don't reduce crime. So you can't say you're tough on crime because that doesn't actually reduce crime. So that's not really the point of prisons and police, obviously. So we talk about how this counterinsurgency and we refer to some of our even prior episodes that went more in depth to that. And we had initially considered making this just part two tough on crime to discuss them just them telling their stories in solitary. But it didn't feel close enough to home of what they really went through. So I'm going to change the myth to um, 
you know, Donald Trump once said this. Would you allow U.S. interrogators to waterboard terrorist prisoners in order to extract information? Absolutely. And don't tell me it doesn't work. Torture works, okay, folks? Torture, you know, have these guys. Torture doesn't work. Believe me, it works, okay? You know, torture works. <laughs> um, because at the end of the day, even though he was referring to military torture in the sense of, like, capturing a so-called terrorist or something of that nature, the same logic, again, of counterinsurgency permeates throughout, you know, this the entire um apparatus of whether you're just dealing with the military the police the prisons this is how they this is how they see anyone who challenges their their power right <clears throat> in a real way um so you know balagoon and naeem the pendleton two and the prisoners that they worked with whether we're talking about mika um kevin murphy etc who were all involved in this you know them taking over a prison and taking hostages and, and making demands even though they didn't kill anyone you know, the, the Department of Corrections didn't take well to that, right? So the logic of torture is that you capture them and you, you either can extract information from them in the military sense or in the sense of prisons, even though they don't call it torture. When we get to that, they call it, you know, behavior modification. Um, you put them in these places to teach the prisoners that, you know, there's a lesson to be paid here, right? Um, so after Naeem and, um, and Balagoon are sentenced to the 142 and 84 years in 1987, they are, they are put, they really are already in these maximum security units, um, which are just solitary confinement um, post the 85 uprising. But they had been moved around them along with other prisoners like Shaka, Shakur, Israel, and others have been moved around. Um, and the state of Indiana, couldn't contain them. They were still organizing in prisons, right? So they built what we call supermax prisons or these um maximum mutant these maximum security units or what was known as the maximum control complex, the MCC. And this is discussed in the documentary, but they're also going to discuss it further in the interviews you're going to hear today. <clears throat> that was like the first prison that was built strictly for this um these so-called hardened prisoners as they call it. Um but you, when you look into the records, you found that a lot of these people were transit prisoners and they were putting people in these units who were technically supposed to be sent somewhere else. They were making up claims of dangerousness and that these were unlawful, violent, the most violent prisoners. And a lot of the people there didn't even fit their own qualifications. But this is where Naeem Balagoon was sent. Um, eventually, there's a hunger strike, as you'll hear about them discuss today. That strike lasted for about 37 days. There was actually multiple hunger strikes, but the first one was 37 days. and um, <clears throat> You know, the they were protesting again, they'll get into it, terrible conditions, you know, poisonous food, um, you know, sensory deprivation, being left in hot and cold cells, all of this stuff you'll hear. <clears throat> but the logic of this, the line to just bring it all back, was that this was supposed to, you know, teach them how to behave, right? And this is not just me saying this, this is not just kind of my extrapolation like this is what was said at the time when you look at newspaper articles <clears throat> so um the director of the prison um the mcc that we're talking about this is in westville indiana charles wright um said in a newspaper article when he was asked he said um <clears throat> he doesn't see these conditions as humanizing he says he sees them as being controlling this is right direct quote he said the purpose of this program referring to maximum control complex that they were sent to is to attempt to have these offenders understand that they are in prison and prisons have rules and regulations. Then he later goes on to say in another article where the headline itself was <laughs> prison system shows inmates who's boss. He says, um, the inmates don't run this prison. We run it. No one wants to come here. <clears throat> and then he said he welcomes the people, the reporters there, but won't allow them to speak to um, to any of the inmates there. So it's also important to note that in the article, he does deny that there was any kind of torture or abuse or so or civil or human rights violations. But you 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 have to ask, why would they be going on hunger strike? I mean, you know, I, I, so we're going to take their word on that. Again, I don't want to tell the story. I want to let Naeem and Balagoon tell the story, but this just gives you some backdrop. It's this myth that by 
you know, doing some of the most heinous things to people that this is a good thing, right? He literally says it like the point is to let them know the prisons have rules and and he says this is about control, right? Like he says this, this is not a, you know, me, this isn't conjecture, but it was torture. Like when you listen to them tell their stories, when you think about the fact that they went on a hunger strike just to get out of these conditions and even the hunger strike ended, um, the last four inmates who were part of the hunger strike, the hunger strike ended because they got a court order where they could force feed them food, right? Like that's that's how this ends, right? The first hunger strike. So the idea that the torture works <laughs> and that, you know, is very much connected to tough on crime. It's very much connected to this idea that if you beat if you beat people down, if you brutalize them, if you punish them in the most heinous ways, that that will produce a more effective behavior, so-called for society. But really this isn't about that, right? Like this is clearly about, you know, punishing and teaching a certain group of people what their position is and where they should stay and making sure that everybody understands what happens if they if they step out of line. And that's what this was really about. Similar to tough on crime, this logic that, you know, we talked in the first episode about um broken windows policing and all of this like getting people for small petty thefts that the point or just petty crimes in general at the point was to discipline the population and you know so they would have pride in their communities so we can't have any more broken windows or whatever but really again we we demonstrate very clearly that this stuff doesn't even work and when you hear them talking there, there's nothing that they're going to tell you that's going to make it sound like this torture worked or that this torture was helpful or that this mentality of riding people and then hoping that they respond with in, in some positive way then this doesn't work this is proven many different ways so today um, we want to let them speak on it. And again, I want to push people to watch the film because um, this is just them talking about solitary. This doesn't get into the entire story. And some of you have heard it, but it's best, I think, to watch it and see it put together in, in a different way than maybe just hearing it on a podcast because we have visuals, we have newspaper articles and stuff, et cetera, et cetera. We have music and all of that. So please watch it and please donate whatever you have. All of these things will be in the show notes. Um, but today, again, we're going to, get into these interviews that we couldn't put into the film and editing the film was tough admittedly. Um, but this is, this is the stuff, some of this you will hear in the film, but there's longer, more details, honestly, more heinous descriptions of what happened than they even made the film. Cause the film only has one section on solitary. The whole film wasn't about it. So you're going to get to hear about an hour and some change. What you will be hearing to be clear will be an, interview by Naeem Trotter, Christopher Naeem Trotter. Um, that is done by my co-director and producer, um, King Trill. And then you will hear after that a interview um, with myself and uh, John Balagoon Cole, uh, both of them discussing their experience dealing with torture, dealing in solitary confinement. Um, <clears throat> it should also just be noted that solitary confinement even if you didn't abuse the inmates, it's just torture to hold somebody in solitary confinement for 20 and 32 years, right? Like 20 years, 32 years, that's torture, even if you never did anything to them. Um, so that's what you'll be hearing. So let's get into it. See, that's what I want to, that's what I want to talk to you now. We, we discussed the events and, and certain aspects of your life leading up to you going into Pendleton. We know a lot of the events that happened during the uprising and why it took place. Now what I want to talk to you about is after you go through the process with the, with the kangaroo court of a, of, a, of a courtroom, defending yourself in this, uh, for these, all these pumped up charges of the uh, uprising, so now, after that, after you received that 142 years, as you were saying about the solitary confinement, walk us through what life was like after that. Life after that was hell. It was hell. Um, they transferred me and my co-defendant, John Cole, down to the farm where they had this maximum security lockup unit. And so while we were there, there used to be this officer that came and looked in the window. He was a lieutenant. He would look in the cell window 
and then he would take off running. And then the next thing I know, they would have the E squad in front of my cell. And they would say, lock up, Trotter. You know, come and cuff up. And I would say, cuff up for what? He said, cuff up. I said, I ain't do that. So what if I would cuff up? They would open the cell door and, and, and rush me and throw me down and start to beat me with riot batons, you know, uh, beat my ankles, my groin area. And this went on almost twice a week, you know. I'm sitting in the cell with broken ribs and, you know, uh, sprung ankles and knees and and every time they would come to my cell, I would constantly say I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. And then I realized one day that they didn't care if I did anything or not. They, you have one minute remaining. They were there to carry out their own form of vindictive justice. Yes, sir. The how long did this go on, these type of beatings where your bones were broken? How long did this go on? I, it, it went on until that one day I realized that, hey, they didn't care I didn't do nothing. And that was like almost six or seven months until I started fighting back. When I realized that they didn't care if I did anything or not, they were going to run in that cell. I stopped cutting. I stopped cutting up, and I fought back. I used all my military training and fought back. Yeah. 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 What you been going through after it? Like, how many times did you go to a hospital because of these attacks? Could you say that again? Could you repeat that? I said, how many times have you been seen by a medical because of the attacks that you endured while you were in the home? Oh, at that time, none. 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 So, no, so, I, so, I, I, so, yeah, so the ribs time, had to hit on the wall? Yes, yes, yes. You know, broken nose, ribs, uh, ankles, uh, you, you, you name it, uh, no, no medical attention. Tell me about, tell me, just give me a quick run down the back of the Excuse me? Just give me a quick run down of the injuries that you have endured. I've endured a broken ankle, broken arm, broken ribs, broken nose, uh, black eyes, um, uh, knees, strong knees, because they would twist them, um, uh, swollen testicles because they would take the riot batons and, and beat my testicles with them. Yeah. You know, those are just some of the things, you know. Uh, and that was the first two years where the uh, DOC was at its most vindictiveness. You know, um, uh, and 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 again, like I said, um, it didn't stop till I started fighting back. You know, that's when it stopped. That's when, it stopped. That's when at the at the farm, at the farm, that's when it stopped. And and once I left the farm, I went down to Michigan City. It, it continued again because I was just transferred from one lockup unit to another lockup unit. It continued again. You know, the same type of mental, physical, you know, abuse uh, by, at the hands of prison guards. Um, 
I remember one time down, I was down in Michigan City on lockup. I was on this lockup unit called NSB, and uh, a whole bunch of big wigs came from central office. And I remember them standing in front of my cell and telling me their scars were still fresh. And this was almost like eight or nine years later, you know. Is this the last time they told you the story they made them what they told you? Excuse me? Is that directly exactly what they said, that their scars were still yeah. fresh? Their scars were still fresh, yeah. Yeah. So what I mean, did you say that to me? It meant that as long as I was in the DOC, you know, they were going to do everything within their power to punish me. You know, that's, yes, that's, 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 yeah, that's, that's what I took it to be, and, 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 and that's exactly what they did. You know, um, well, what happened? they opened, and go ahead. they did the same thing when you were in this city, the same type of attack. Yeah, the same type of physical and mental abuse, and there was, they opened a new complex, which people might be familiar with, called MCC, the Mexican Control, Control, Control Complex. Uh, is that, is that a all that? Yes, yes, that's down in Westfield, yes. They shook us all down there when it first opened. And this was supposed to be modeled after Pelican Bay. Uh, they shook us all down there. This was supposed to be for the worst of the worst, you know. But at the time, the state of Indiana didn't really have a culture of the worst of the worst. And so the criteria was so ambiguous, it was like they could go back 20 years if you had any type of history of assault or any type of conduct that they considered a, a major proportion, they could just snatch you up and place you at MCC. And the reason they had to do that was because they promoted this torture unit but didn't have the bodies to fill it. So now we have to create a criteria to go. They can go back as far as 15 or 20 years if you had an assault on a prisoner or a a uh, petty salt on a guard or something, they could snatch you up and put you in NCC. So that's what we did. And so for the guards to live up to their, to their image, they had to inflict mental and physical abuse on you. Uh, MCC was one of the most treacherous lockup units I've ever been on in my life. Uh, they had hot and cold cells, you know, the, the cold cell where, you know, you didn't even have a blanket. And, and I, I'm talking about the cells were so cold that you would, you know, basically just sit up all night long and just shiver. You're, you, you're on the borderline of hypothermia, you know? Yeah. And, I know. I, I was in Westville. And I was in how cold I used to be at night. Yeah. You know, I remember yeah. how we had the bad blankets. And, but see, we could get blankets. We were just in the prison itself. And we were still right. in And we went to sleep with our coat, fully dressed, pants, and everything. And we'd still be right. in that coat. And then, so what they would do was put you in the cold cell for two weeks. Then they would move you to a hot cell. The cells would be so hot, you're constantly irritable. And so when people get irritable, you, you get agitated. You start to, you know, you, you're so hyped, you, you, you're so frustrated 
that you're going to get to hollering and screaming. And so that's what they wanted to do. That's what they wanted. So they could come in now with their squads and punish you, strip everything out your cell, you know. And so, you know, um, we struggled around the torturous unit at MCC, got the attention of the federal government. Um, they came and had new guidelines for FCC. You had, we had went on a hunger strike. Some of it lasted almost to 30 days. Uh, you know, had prisoners that cut off one of the prisoners, cut his finger off. And, you know, um, because of the type of torturous oppression that existed at that time, you know, it, 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 we had to go to those extremes in order to get any type of attention. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know? And then I left MCC and I was sent to the shoe. And on the shoe, it's a windowless cell where you locked in the cell 24 hours a day. Everywhere you go, you're on a dog leash, you know. And they they train their officers on this shoe to be abusive. Their motto is, what happens in the shoe stays in the shoe. That is their motto. That's their motto. You know, it was a prison within a prison, you know. And the guards abide by that motto, you know. Regardless what they did, they had each other's backs. They had each other's backs. And that was some of the most torturous, physical, um, dehumanizing conditions imaginable. You know, I, I mean, that was a living hell. Can you, you know, tell us one of the worst things? Like, I mean, everything you have said has been just terrible. Can you tell us one of the worst things that you endured in there during that time? In, 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 in the show, some of the worstest things that I endured in the show was what we would, what they would call um, the sensory deprivation. You know. Um, okay. What type of deprivation? Sensory deprivation. That means that having the lights stay on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, not seeing the night sky. If you go outside in the wintertime, they would leave you out there in the bitter cold for five and six and seven hours and won't let you in. If you went to take a shower, they would leave you confined in a little shower for four or five hours before they come back and get you out of it. Oh, my God. You know, these were some of the tactics that they would use on the shoot. You know, not to mention that when they walked you on the lead strap, they would take one part of the lead strap and put it under your leg shackles. And at any time, they would just pull that lead strap and you would fall right on your face. You know, you had no way to catch yourself. Nine out of ten times, you were going to you know, knock your teeth out your mouth, you know. Uh, they, 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 they treated prisoners like real animals to the point where, you know, um, they would put stuff in your food, feces in your food, you know. Um, throw your food on the floor and take off running down the ranges. You know, it was just, it, it was horrible. That that was a horrible experience, you know. Cool. 
I got to ask you, because every time I talk to you, even before I knew all of these details and I just knew that you had been banned for a very long time. And even in our first conversation, when I when we did that interview during um, a setting at a, at a college law school, you know, you have always been very encouraging, very positive, very uplifting in your feet to everyone. I just have to ask because I need to know myself. How does a person go through such levels of service, psychologically and physically, but still be able to be so very positive and encouraging as I see you are to all the two How do you do that? I'm so for the simple fact here is that I didn't want to become the monster that they wanted me to be. I, I, I wanted to maintain my sense of humanity, you know, at all costs. At all costs, I wanted to maintain my sense of humanity. You know, that's that inner God in us, you know, that allows us that no matter what you do to me, I'm not going to turn around and do it to you. Or I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of becoming that that you want me to be. You know? Amazing. I, people fear what they don't understand and they hate what they can't conquer. And I've always understood that, you know, no matter what they did to me, I wouldn't complain about it, you know, right. I, I, I dealt with it, you know, um, I come from a spiritual family, I, I have spiritual ancestors, and we believe in forgiveness. Not for them, but for us. We won't allow hate to consume us and I and I and right today I don't allow hate to consume me. You know. I'm mad. Right. I'm, I'm real mad. But I use that negative energy in a constructive manner. Wow. You know? Yeah. And that's what it's all about. Turning that negative into a positive. Using that negative energy in a constructive manner, in a positive manner. Because you can you decide know? how that energy that you feel within you is expressed. And exactly. One thing I know... And I believe it be true that regardless of the circumstance, you have the free will to choose which attitude you take. You know? Okay. And I feel that regardless of my situation, whether it's in prison or it's out there in free society, that I still have a purpose in life. And yes, right now, is. my purpose, and right now, my purpose is to continue to fight against the injustice that I witness every day inside this belly of the beast. And continue to do everything that I can do to expose death care, which is a lack of health care right. to do everything that I can do to the, to expose the, the you know the discrimination that exists you know amongst prisoners the racism that exists 
inside the BOC that's perpetuated by prison guards. She meant to the youth to come in here to give them some type of hope and inspiration and lead by example, which is most important. Lead by example. It's not about what me do as I say, not as I do. I want to lead by example. I want to be an inspiration to say, hey, you can get through this. Yeah. You know, the time is going to do itself. Just find out how you do how you do that time. You can either do it in a positive manner or a negative manner. But at the yeah. end of the day, I believe in doing the time and not letting the time do me. Definitely, definitely. You know, and and, and, and today I'm encouraged uh, by people like yourself, by people like Conrad Ben, the whole IDOT Watch community that support. You have one minute remaining. Listen. My other supporters like Andrea, I'm encouraged by people that's still on the outside that's reaching in here, you know, yeah. and that what gives me hope today. You yes, know? sir. Yes, sir. That there's still people out there that have a, a, a love of humanity, that believe in freedom, that believe in justice, but most yeah. importantly, believe in the abolishment movement, that believe that prison should be abolished. The that we exist upon the right today is not designed to meet the people, needs of the people. And it needs to be eradicated. That's true. Yeah. 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 Set it out of the company. It was a year and a half ago. July of uh, 2021. Well, I've been holding him back up for 32 years, nine months. You know, pretty much forced to settle because of the cold situation. I didn't want to take no chances of uh, dragging that situation out and get, get, getting sick and getting nothing. You know, I had yeah. the Conrad's that died from that COVID. Yeah. Oh, no. So, you know. Um, then Logamar died from COVID, too, then. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Related, uh, to this. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Okay, so, I mean, if you could, um, just kind of take, take us back to when, when y'all were, um, when y'all were persecuted, when you, when you were sentenced to, to the 84 years. Um, and you got put down in the hole. I know, uh, Minka said he spent three years. I know Naeem spent 20 years down there. So what, what was it like? I have Naeem's side of that. And I know it was a, it was tough, tough, tough to even hear him discuss. Yeah, well, you know, it's like, Michigan City, 
the more I get down to Michigan City in 88, they didn't want me there. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't want me at Michigan City. You know, but the commissioner, commissioner officer said that that's where they wanted me. You know, and they had told central office that central office insisted that, you know, this is where I be. So when I got there, uh, it was on IDU, approximately two months. Then they snatched me up from IDU and put me on top of the hospital in what they call the special management cell. So it's kept up there in the special management cell on top of the hospital. It's three cells. You know, when uh, they let the management cell then it's you know so small that what you can do in the cells is pretty much sleep. You know, you can't really exercise there ain't enough space, right? But what are we what are what are we talking with space like? Basically, just a bed, a bed and a toilet, but you know, no room to really do no no push ups or nothing like that. Yeah. If you do the push ups, you got to do them on the bed, and you know, the place was filthy. You know, it was filthy, just a whole bunch of dirt and black soot. You know, uh, but they had just made these cells up. You know. Uh, uh, not too long prior to me, you know, arriving back. You know, it was some kind of pigeons outside the, the window of the cell, you know, making all the damn noise, stinking. You know, if I stay there about 90 days, and they on top of that, on top of the hospital. And when they brought me down there in 88, they exchanged me for Mustafa. They had a policy that me and Mustafa couldn't be in the same prison at the same time no more, right? What's the policy? The, the John Cole or Miles Goodman can't be in the same prison. So when I got there in 88, he he was transferred to the state form in my place, right? Wow. It was like a swap? You know? It was like a swap? Yeah, it was a swap. It was a swap. They, me and Mustafa, you know, so... But I, I was placed on that hospital. You did got the he had got that 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 got that I got there, stayed there for ninety days. Then all of a sudden, abruptly, they came and told me that I was being placed on AS. They put me on AS. And AS AS stands for Ministry of Segregation. Okay. First, I was disciplinary, you know. So I went to AS. Stayed on AS for, this is 88, I stayed on there from 88 to 91. In 91, I was caught in an attempt to escape. They said I tried to escape to the prison. They tried, they, 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 they. They, they, they came and got me and sent me to MCC. I went to MCC, I think it was June of 91. I went to MCC in June of 91. Right to Michigan City from, uh, it came from like Michigan City in 88. It was October of 88. If I'm not mistaken, I got there October of 88. It, it, for 90 days, the NSB stayed on NSB from 88 way into June of 1991. June of 1991, was transferred to MCC. Now, when I'm doing this time, I'm doing this time among brothers, you know, that I don't forge relationships with, and brother, you know, towards the brotherhood with over the years. We knew each other. This is Lamar, J, and Dirty Red, you know, so on and so on. t shot all of us are on the units together. Wilbur Moore Bay, you know, 
So, you know, like we didn't, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to tell, but, you know, we made, we, 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 we made the most out of a bad situation. We kept each other sane, you know, oh. you know, despite, you know, despite the brutality of, you know, the condition, we kept each other sane. So, so today, how did you get, what is it, 23 hours lockdown? What's, what's, how, what's the yeah, point? Yeah, took the time. We was on AS, we got three hours worth of wreck. We was locked down 21 hours a day. Mm. So they gave us three hours worth of wreck, right? You know, so it was a little different, you know, than what, what, what it is now when you're under control, you know. We was locked down 21 hours a day. We got three hours of wreck. Mm. But when I get to, when I get to MCC, it's entirely different. You know, at this particular time in 1991, they got this mindset that uh, they 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 uh, they going they dealing with the most corrigible prisoners in the Department of Corrections. So they done snatched us all out of these prisons that Westfield, Pendleton, Michigan City, etc. They done smashed all of us down here. And this this is when me and Mustafa was allowed to be in the same prison again for the first time since 1982, 83. We was in the same prison that we was at MCC. We at MCC, the condition down there was so brutal. Was, they they imposed the, 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 the draconic restrictions like they had at Marion, Illinois. And I don't know if you're familiar with Mary in Illinois, but at that particular time, this was before they had put Florence, they, had, they had built Florence, Colorado. Mary in Illinois was kind of like, you know, a level six prison. Mm-hmm. And, and them dudes wasn't allowed, you know what I'm saying, to really move or have any type of rotation with anybody. But when we got down at MC, uh, MCC, that's how they was playing us. We come out our cell. We had to come out, you know, with with leg shackles on, uh, handcuffs on. And when they would put that, you know, when we come out, we had to kneel down like, you know, like used to do the brothers in the LA when they were, you know, like the police went to get them, they made them kneel on the ground. Mm-hmm. They made us kneel down to get our shackles and shit on, right? And then they, you know, when they escorted us from our cell to the wreck, to the wreck uh, uh, area, you know, there was two polices escorting us, you know. One held a handcuff, while the other one had a baton, you know, with a piece of metal sticking out of it. Mm. So if in the event that, you know, when, uh, 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 they had any problems with us, he could poke us in our ribs and separate our ribs, you know. Mm. And, you know, they, 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 they uh, uh, we was molested every day. You know, you couldn't come out without them shaking you down and, you know, going and shit, you know. They went over, you know, so. We every, every day, every day you stepped every up. Every day, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of like, you know, you have to go through this physical molestation. And <clears throat> the conditions were so we didn't have no TVs. We wasn't permitted to have TV, right? We had to be there six months in order to earn the right to have a TV. So we did had you no videos. But no information? We had, we had no watches. We yeah. was able to tell the time of the day was not counting the meals that we got, wow. right? You know, it was, it was cold, bro, you know. We couldn't keep no... It, no, no utensils in our cell. In, everything that we got on the tray, we was we 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 we
have they made you participate in this this behavior modification program that they had put in place. You know, in other words, like say if I was there and I gave them six to seven months with, you know, good behavior. I ain't did nothing. I ain't got no write up. I ain't act out at nothing. Well, that six or seven months don't count. If I don't send in a request slip to the counselor and tell them that I want to be credited with with, with my vested month. They have this program they call vested how, month. How, so how would you send them a request? It sounds like, sound like you didn't have none of yourself. Yeah, they would, well, they'd send you, they give you requests that's when they come through the pass out supply, mm -hmm. right? And so you did, got, you, if you did 30 days and you didn't get no, you know, they have what they call, a, a, like if you didn't get rolled up for a bad day, you know, a bad day was something, if you did something that was against the rule, they, you'd get a bad day, right? But if you didn't get no bad day, you were allowed to be credited with a, a vested month, you know? Mm. And so if you got 24 consecutive vested months, you could be released within 24 months. But if you didn't get 24 consecutive months, you couldn't be released until you got 36 vested months right how you not gonna have a bad day i guess i'm just thinking about i ain't i've, I've, I've never been there but i can't see i can't i mean i don't even have 24 good good days out here i don't know how you have 24 good months out here you know what i mean how do you have a good day for two years yeah that's you know it, it, you know you had to be exceptional to meet that two-year crack you know to get 24 best of months to get out like that. You know, and a few dudes made it out in 24 months. I made it out in 36, right? Mm -hmm. But a few dudes made it out in 24. While we was going through all these great kind of restrictions and being, you know, treated as sons. We stormed the organized, right, among myself. Mm -hmm. And we decided, you know, to traumatize the conditions that we were being exposed to or subjected to, the best way to do it, we were trying to figure out the best way to do it. Because they were, they were prepared to deal with us on the physical. Right. You know, like, it's rebellious. And I've always been recounting prisoners, you know, who would, you know, uh, go to war with the police, right? In this particular setting, they was prepared to deal with us like that. So we knew we couldn't win those type of confrontations. So came up with this this idea of, man, we're gonna we're gonna starve our bodies. We're gonna go on a hunger strike, and we and we went on a hunger strike, bro. You know, you know. I mean, you probably heard about it. Yeah, yeah. Successful demonstrations I'd ever been a part of. 18 days, you know, uh, they had to break it because we couldn't drink the water, you know, drink the milk, you know, and they said if I drunk the milk, that wasn't, that wasn't considered not eating because the milk had, you know, milk get protein in the milk, and so I mean, went 18 days, Shaka went 20, and then Israel, Bill Sadly went 30. 37 days, you know, they had to get a quarter of it, you know, and, and, and beat them, right? What was the, uh, what were the, what were the demands for that strike? It was, it was demanding, you know, that the, that the unit be shut down, mm. you know, it demanded that the unit be shut down because it was, you know, it was inhumane the way in which they was treated. So, yeah, you know, you had Marion. He was being treated worse than the prisoners that was housed in Mary. The, 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 the restrictions imposed on us was couldn't have I just couldn't have radio. You know what I'm saying? And we couldn't get a visit, you know. And and we had to be there six months, you know, with with six months clear before we were allowed to watch our TV. And then, you know, after we had got a year clear. We was in like TV, you did it for 24 hours, you know, nonstop. 
that six months we've been over there live to watch it. We did X amount, say like six albums a day. Well, yeah. 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 we got out of the. How did the how did the guards treat y'all? The COs they had them, but they were trained to deal with us. You know, they was they were they were supposed to be in the best of the best, you know. And none of them deviated. None of them showed any leniency, right? Mm-hmm. And like if you kicked them, you know, they, uh, so you had them, you had emergency buttons on the cells. Where you press the button, let them know you know you needed you needed something. But if you press that button, and they told you not to press that button, or you kicked on that door, they would come back there with the extraction team, and they would dog you out. They would put you in four way restraints. A lot of brothers stayed in four way restraints for months, and then they had the, they had this section. They had four sections on each part. They had the tan section, the peach section, the yellow section, and the blue section. The tan section was where the law library was located at in each section. I mean, the tan, you know, each, 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 each part, you know, and this is where we used to go, you know, to, to get our lawn material. Mm-hmm. And all the time, you know, when we went to get our lawn material, you know, the books would be all fucked up. You know, they'd be butchered with, you know, uh, a lot of stuff that we needed wouldn't be in there. And uh, uh, it was really inadequate. And, uh, when you say the, can you, can you describe the four ways people who are going to hear this a little bit more detail? With restraints, yeah. The four restraints is is is, 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 is being restrained where they lay you in a bed, right? Mm-hmm. And they they shackle your hands, you know, over your hands to the edge of the bed, and then at the same time they they shackle your ankles mm. to you know to, to to the bed where you can't do nothing but lay on your back, mm. right? And you 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 held there. Now, not only when they put you in forward restraints, they also take your clothes. And so you ain't got nothing oh but God. a T-shirt and underwear, you know. And it's cold in there, too, right? Yeah, and, and, they, and, and, the, and the temperatures are frigid. They deliberately, you know what I'm saying, make sure that there's no heat coming in there. They got that cooling, central cooling system turned up on high. And so... You being restrained like that, and you only have being permitted to have your underwear and a t-shirt and them frigid temperatures, it's it's paramount to torture. Yeah. You know. And then you know what I'm saying, you ain't got no mattress, right? You know, you know, you don't get to, you know, all the time you wouldn't get your mat they take your mattress from you. Six to seven o'clock in the morning, and they would put it in your cell at the nine o'clock at night, right? Why, you know, what this was is how they treat. They just doing uh, that. They just did that to mess with you, or or they say you did something uh, wrong, or what's the? They was implementing this form of behavior modification. Nah, no, behavior so modification is done like for honestly. But go ahead. Yeah, what they would do, what they would do is this. They come through there and say, when we come through here in the morning, if your bed is not made, then we're stripping you out, right? It's a lot of cats going to make their bed, right? Man, I ain't making that motherfucker bed. You know, fuck that. And then strip them out, right? They come in there and take your mattress and your, 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 your bedding and sheets and blankets. And they keep they have it rolled up outside of your cell, you know, say six or seven o'clock in the morning. And you wouldn't get it back until nine, or eight o'clock at night, right? And uh, you know, we went through that for about three, four years, man, until we got, you know, uh, the CLU and. 
ownership or if you own it on the station, you know, if, you know, we had, we got Amnesty International to come down there and, and, and look at how we was being treated and they wrote a hell of an expose on, you know, what was going on. You yeah, had cats, you know, that was losing their minds down there, start wiping feces and stuff all on their body and on their wall and cutting their wrists and shit. You know, it's a hard time. You know, and you know, uh, to you know, to add insult to injury, the water was toxic. I couldn't drink. It. You know, I, 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 you know, you know, recently I had some health problems where I suffered uh, some procedures, and then they discovered they don't that I had a, a tumor in my brain. I can't say this definitively, but I believe that the tumor that I had on my brain was a result of all that toxic that I was exposed to at MCC for all those years. Mm -hmm. You know, I drank that water, man. I break out with hives, itching. You know, it's like a thousand needles sticking me at the same time. You know, you know, and uh, I, I, hope that any other environmental management, I wrote to people up in uh, uh, Chicago, too, that, that deals with the environment. They came over there and checked the water, you know, but they didn't examine us, you know. Right. They went through hell down there, bro. We went through hell. That was some the time. I was proud of some of the stuff that we accomplished. You know, we, uh... We changed those conditions and, you know, got it, made it a little more humane, you know, for people to be there. You know, uh, uh, they eventually did away with the behavior modification shit, you know, after about four or five years suits and stuff that we had found. And then uh, the human rights organization coming down and taking and get, you know, the going, coming and doing tours of the place. You know, the, the commissioner and all of them kind of like backed off some of that stuff. Yeah, it was brutal, man. It was brutal. Yeah, so they, yeah, so when you, um, when you were down there, um, how did you maintain sanity? Like you said, obviously some people understandably lost their mind. You know, like you said, they're rubbing feces on the wall. How did you maintain? How did you maintain your, yourself? I know we talked yesterday about once you got older, you started coming to a different understanding. Is this around that time? Yeah, well, you know, tell me, I used to have a lot of fantasies. This floor, and do you know what I'm saying? How many? The only time I was fantasizing about, you know, getting vengeance against them people, you know, that was, that was you know, uh, brutalized me, right? And I maintained my sanity it is, in, in other ways by reading. Now, I was reading about other people that went through similar experiences that I went through, and I drew strength from them, you know. And, who did you, you know, read? Times I didn't think I was good to read. Was, who are you, you reading? Who, uh, who are you reading? Read, uh, you know, I specifically. I read about the uh, the brothers was going through down in Philadelphia. Jimmy was who? Jimmy? Who me? Cats was experiencing down there in Canada. Read about Bobby Sands over in the island, you know, and things about. Read the book. Uh, it was a novel. Read Papillon. Mm -hmm. You know, it was every sustain. I was doing stripping in books, man. And the characters, you know, came there. When I got there in 19. Uh, 91, I entered the unit, I weighed 256 pounds. When I left, when I left in 1994, uh, I, I got out, I, I got there June of 1991, 
and I was released in May 1994. When they released me, bro, weighed 178 pounds. Wow. You hear me? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You got something. Damn, you lost 100 pounds. Once you, once once you brought the 
attention to the situation. They they shut it down, and then they moved you, and then they moved you where that wasn't. Once we got that lawsuit, they shut it down as part of a, a dissent decree settlement, mm-hmm. right? You know, they shut the unit down as part of a dissent decree. You know, they, they, they you know, that's what happened. That's what, that's what made them shut, that, shut the unit down with regards to the behavior modification aspect. Then they just turned it into a regular lockup unit. Yeah. Yeah. So these are for these part of the. I remember when I talked to Shaka, he talked about uh, the shoe unit. What he, what is, was this all part of that expansion of the shoe unit? Yeah, that's it. This is what happened. At this particular time, they were
sure. Yeah. Did, any, did anything like that ever happen to you when you targeted you looking before a child? Yeah, man, they, you know, they treated me like I was some type of exotic animal in a zoo. You know, like, you know, uh, when they came, you know, like, when they be having interviews, I mean, when they be having, uh, not interviews, when they be bringing officials through various prisons to do it, and they might come to the lockup units or the segregation units and, you know, stuff like that. I see a big old line of all these civilians and these big bees, and I hear them whisper, that's him right there. He didn't say I'm so and so, so and so. He talking about me, right? You know, and I done had police tell me, I done had COs tell me once they got to know me. Man, you ain't nothing like, you know, I thought you was going to be. He said, you know, they take, he said, before I start working here, when I was being trained, they used to take and show us tapes of you, Miles Goodner, and your rappy trotter. And they used to train us showing us pictures and tapes of you guys, right? In other words, they was conditioning us to hate us, to hate you before we even met you, you know? And they used to tell us, you they don't never allow these inmates here to get behind you, they'll cut your throat, right? Wow. And, yeah, so, you know, they used to tell me that. So they was all, they would set me up, you did, to be murdered, to be killed, you know? And, you know, by God, if an event, you know, the first, con you know, physical confrontation that they might have had with me in the aftermath of the February 1st ride. But I'm reading and I'm studying now, right? right. And so I know, see, shit unfold before it unfolds. So I never let them play me, paint me in that type of corner, you know? And then, you know, I've been lucky, you know, by the grace of God, I'm still here. You know, yeah. there's a few times, you know what I'm saying, that I got up something. Yeah. People like, fuck, I don't give a fuck, you know. But, yeah, I'm, the thing, you know, go, go the ahead. thing is, uh, no, I said, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. The thing is, you know, once you start doing a lot of reading and studying, it's kind of hard for you to act contrary to what you know, mm. right? And so, you know, when, 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 you, when you got an understanding, you know, about how things really work or how things should work, you know, it, it makes you, it, 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 it won't let you do anything contrary to what you really understand, right? If you in control, if you in, you know, if you in, you know, reactionary, and that's what happened to me, you know. So that so so that you were basically painted as like you, naive, and a few others were painted as public enemy number one, uh -huh. and, 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 you, and you had to learn, you had to learn how. That, that already put you in a, a bad spot. I mean, you already locked up anyway, but then on top of that, there you're like the guy that everybody's looking out for. So you had to really be cautious, I imagine. Yeah, I, yeah. exactly. And they was, they was trying to keep me isolated because now, you know, the minute I was the one that spearheaded that, that situation at the reformatory, you did to a lot of cats, you know what I'm saying? I've been put on a pedestal and I'm looked upon as this symbol of resistance, you know? Mm -hmm. I got a lot of influence, but I never used my influence recklessly. You know, I never sent dudes up for no suicide mission. Told them to do something that I wouldn't do for them, you know? I've always been that type of leader. Right. I asked you to do nothing for me that I wouldn't do for you, right? right. She did respect me, you did, for that, right? right so, so part of this, part of this wasn't just about, um, wasn't just about, you know, punishing y'all, but also a lot of this was, they didn't want the, they didn't want your politics, they didn't want the symbol that you and 
Naeem and others were, they didn't want that to inspire anyone else. Is that a fair perspective? It came of similar uh, condemnation. Like, if in the event that if you ever decide to take matters in your own hand and seize your prison, you know, understand, we're going to treat you like we treated John Cole. You don't lock up so long, you know what I'm saying, that people going to forget about you. And, you know, if you don't die, why are you back there on these lock-up units or on these control units? You're going to go crazy. Mm-hmm. So think about that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I ever, ever asked either one of y'all about this. I know we say political prisoner. And I and I and y'all are political prisoners, but what is that? What does that mean to you? I mean, because you live that, you're living that, you know. So what does it mean when someone says you're a political prisoner or anyone? Um, what does that mean? Was a political prisoner. Am a political prisoner. Uh, be reluctant to, 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 to say that because I understand that we live in a time and era now where they punish you for having a certain type of mindset, espousing certain type of views. Mm-hmm. We talked about the Ferguson situation last night, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm just, you know, you know instead of, you know, political side of the situation, you know, I just basically, you know what I'm saying, count it. From, from a social standpoint, a progress that social standpoint, you know, rather than, you know, you know what, you know, I'm political and I'm a new African or <laughs> I ain't really necessarily been doing that mm-hmm. because I think these are the times to do that. They they really persecute people, you know, when they align themselves like that, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Seeing that, man, you know, Yeah, that's that's uh that's that's my case though, you know. You know, except you know, when we look at the facts of it, yeah, I'm in here because, you know, it was the case was political. Right. You know. Right. And long you know spend it, you know, what we did was 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 what any human being would have did, you know, to defend and preserve the life of that brother. Right. But they say <laughs> They're saying that because I'm a black man, or because Lincoln Love was a black man, that we have no rights that they should be bound to respect. You know? Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thanks for sharing all that. I mean, so I guess kind of wrap it up. Uh, so you're down there for 32 and a half years, essentially. So even after the MCC, you go down to the shoe. You don't have to tell me everything. I'm just curious. How long were you down there? Um, and then what eventually got you out of, out of, uh, you know, maximum security? And this is how I got out. After I did so much, t- somebody had, somebody had uh, went down to the commissioner office and they was complaining about those of us. No, no, I think what it was, we'll say that Oprah did this show where she went down in Pelican Bay, right? Mm. And she, she shined the light on cats that was being held on these control units, you know, indefinitely for for decades, right? And when she did that, that that kind of like, you know, trickled down over here in the state of Indiana, where Indiana had, you know, prisoners that were on these control units for decades. And so individuals got to, you know, pushing my name, Pushing Lokmore name and a few other 
prisoner's name that was on these units, you know, Israel, et cetera. Israel had a lawsuit here, you know, at that time, you know, raising those issues before the Oprah show even started. And one thing led to the next, central office came down here with some, represent some representatives and they interviewed some of us and that thing was, they was they was willing to send us to Newcastle, right? Mm. If in the event that you know we agreed to some, these these terms they were setting out, you know, and so some of us agreed, some of us did. So when they came down here, me, Lopo, and a few other cats turned them down. Nah, man, I ain't going no more for Newcastle. Okay, now we ain't jumping through no hoops. We ain't gonna be no part of no behavior modification shit. Right. You know, we feel like we've been locked up long enough, and you know, uh, we deserve to be let loose. Let us loose now. Why the fuck did we have to go down there? Right. And so they, you know, they came, you know, turn them down. About three years later, they came back and, you know, this letter told us they was gonna let us go. And they let us go, man. Mm. You know, yeah. You know, got it. That's how we got out. So it was almost—it was almost an accident. Yeah. 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 Um. And that, and that was after thirty-two and a half years. Yeah, that was that was that was that was right about thirty-two and a half years. Yeah, when they let me out. You know, 32 years and five months, exactly, I got out August the 8th, 2017. All right, thank you for listening. Um, we'll definitely be back with more reflections on this film and just ways to digest, you know, some of the information um, and figure out further action. But for now... Um, you can go to Pendleton2.com, Pendleton, the word Pendleton, the number two dot com. Um, and you can do a variety of things. You can sign the petitions that go to the prosecutor's office and the governor. You can um, donate, which we really would appreciate. You can just straight up donate to the campaign. Um, that goes towards the cost of, you know, all kinds of campaign duties, um, you know, whether it's this film, whether it's traveling whether it's legal legal funds which we're trying to raise all those different things um as well as costs that just come up <clears throat> you can uh, book a screening in your in your area right so we have a form you can fill out that form it's all on the website um you fill a form out it comes to us you just give us some clarification on what your needs are and, and wh who you represent um and then you know we can set up a screening and we can zoom in if it's not too close um, or we can <clears throat> um, travel if you have a budget. Um, for those you have a budget, there's a fee. For people who don't, we essentially waive that budget. There's it's free, um, and you can do a community screening. You can screen in your classroom, something of that nature. And then from there, um, <clears throat> we um, we can talk, have political education. We can um, you know converse about the film and you know raise more awareness about it. Um, you can also write them. That also helps as well. So. There's a list of other things to do on the website, but please do that. Um, again, appreciate it. And we'll be back with some more commentary soon on this. Um, thank you for everybody who stuck with us. Okay. Fresh out the plane in a whole nother state. I'm trying to eat down a whole nother plate. Seems like my homies were stuck in the hood. I just